Hello everyone, Ezekiel Callahan with Raptor Chatter here, here to talk about this month in review. There were some new species found and a couple different studies on how life affected the climate. So without any further ado, let's get into July 2018 for paleontology. During the Cambrian, when we have our first widespread complex life, there was a period of time in which there was a more anoxic environment than what we have today. Which is to say, the water of those times had less oxygen dissolved in it, and so couldn't support life nearly as well. A recent study suggests that this kind of anoxic environment came from many of the burrowing creatures which had evolved for the first time during the period, as they released more sediments into the water, which then bonded with the oxygen and reduced the overall oxygen content of the water, limiting life and potentially causing a mass extinction had life not been able to adapt. However, as you can tell, life did continue, as we and everything else are still here. And so it's important to look at this and see how different creatures can affect environments. And this kind of potential is still being seen today, where beavers are entering the Arctic. Normally they hadn't been there, but now as they're making their dams, they're flooding larger parts of it. And this added water is melting permafrost, which is so-called because it's been permanently frozen. And inside this permafrost are large amounts of methane hydrates and other greenhouse gases that are now being released into the atmosphere, potentially increasing the rate at which global warming is happening. So it's important to look at how these different species have affected environments in the past so that we can plan for things with more accuracy and more attention to detail for what exactly will happen in the future as climate change continues to run its course. Europe had the unique position of having a wide number of different theropods hunting throughout its archipelago during the Jurassic. Notably, in the east, there were species like Metriacanthosaurus, and in the west, Allosaurus. But the most famous and some of the first ones were the Megalosaurus, which apparently had spread throughout the entire continent. And this is from a study of footprints throughout the continent. The footprints that have been found have been attributed to megalosaurs and help to show their spread throughout all of Europe. And this is due largely to their more robust and larger foot size, as opposed to the more slender feet of both the Metriacanthosaurs and the Allosaurs, helping to show how this very unique group, which would eventually evolve into things like Spinosaurus, a very unique dinosaur, were able to spread and become so successful throughout even the later Cretaceous. Moving back to the United States, a new species of ankylosaur named Echinocephalus johnstoni was discovered from Bears Ears National Monument in Utah. This species shows a lot of different morphologies that are more in line with the Asian type of ankylosaurs rather than the American Euoplocephalus or ankylosaurus. This is important as it helps us to understand the different waves of migration that occurred across the Bering Land Bridge during the Mesozoic and can help us understand the different waves of migrations that might occur as climate change opens up and creates new habitats for different species to take advantage of. In France, there was the announcement of the discovery of an ancient elephant ancestor, which had four tusks rather than the two that we see today. The specimen is still inside the rock that it was found in and hasn't been completely cleaned up and had these sediments removed and it is expected by the Natural History Museum in Toulouse that it will take another six to eight months before they're able to finish preparing the skull and then putting out an official, properly written scientific paper on it. However, the announcement is still exciting as it does help us understand how some of the most iconic animals of today became what they are. During the Triassic, dinosaurs were not entirely unique. There were a number of other archosaurs, the group they belonged to, that were also very large land-dwelling predators. For example, there were things like Postosuchus, but there were also other dinosaur morphs, which were very similar, but lacked some of the more specific characteristics that dinosaurs had, such as very specific holes that existed in the hip joints of dinosaurs, but not the dinosaur morphs. A study of Texas fossil assemblages from the Triassic helps us understand how many archosaurs there were, and that they were much more widespread than previously believed. This is important as it helped us understand how species may spread after an extinction, as this was in the period immediately following the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, which killed off about 85% of all life. 
The Argosaurs were able to succeed so greatly, largely due to their more upright legs, and were able to just spread across the land more rapidly due to that posture. And this is important as it helps us to be able to understand what might happen in more modern extinctions. And particularly, it helps us to look at things like amphibians, which don't have that same kind of posture and who are already struggling in the face of climate change and try to understand how they might be able to or not be able to migrate to new locations if need be and why their threat of extinction is so much greater than for the other groups of animals today. The sauropods were the massive dinosaurs of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, which were many, many feet long and many, many tons. However, there was nothing like this that had really been seen in the Triassic, and it seemed as though sauropods just kind of popped up more suddenly than the other groups. However, now we do have a fossil from a sauropodomorph, so not a true sauropod, but one of its ancestors, from the Triassic. And this one was very large. At about 30 feet long and weighing close to 10 tons, Agentia prima was the largest dinosaur of the Triassic. And is notable as, although it was missing some of the qualities that would make it a sauropod, it did have the starts of some of those qualities. Its legs were still bent, rather than the columnar legs that you see in the sauropods. However, in the neck, there are the beginnings of portions of the vertebrae, which would help to make it lighter by allowing air sacs to help fill the neck and reduce the overall weight of the head, which is what would eventually lead to the sauropods having such characteristically long necks that could stretch for such long distances. Burmese amber has given us some fantastic fossils in the last few years, such as a partially preserved baby bird or a dinosaur tail that was preserved in amber. However, there's still even more recent finds coming from this Burmese amber. For example, most recently, there was a baby snake caught in the amber. Snakes are already hard to fossilize as they have such small, fragile bones that even just normal sedimentation that preserves many of the dinosaurs that we do currently get is still enough to damage the bones to a point where they aren't recognizable or aren't of much use if they are recognizable. However, since this was an amber, it was protected. And so we're able to understand how snakes were able to begin evolving in Gondwana, the southern continent, and then begin their spread northwards from there. Sauropods are known for being incredibly large, and a lot of people have said, oh, well, they would need so much food to be able to eat this, they, I, I, we don't know how they could have done this. However, a new study looked at what happened, and a lot of the idea had been based on studies of insects, which finds that when there's greater CO2 in the air, for insects specifically, their plant foods become less nutritious. And so this was applied to a wider spectrum of species that more CO2 means that foods are, and plants are going to be less nutritious. This most recent study grew some of the kinds of plants that would have lived back during the Mesozoic. This study set up a controlled greenhouse which mimicked the conditions of the environment during the Mesozoic and grew species closely related to those that grew during that time period, notably ginkgos, cycads, and conifers all of which were main food sources or would have been main food sources for many of these large sauropods and found that in these higher CO2 conditions, they actually would have become more nutritious for many of these species, particularly as bugs aren't notable for eating many of these larger trees, at least the bugs we have today, such as grasshoppers and locusts. This is important because applying a single idea for a single species across the board to all other species is still problematic. And this helps us understand just how the sauropods were able to stay so competitive. It's not that they needed to eat massive, massive amounts of food. They could actually get by on significantly less than what we had previously thought. Potentially only 100 to 150 pounds of food a day, as opposed to the potentially 800 suggested by some researchers a few years ago. A new species of Mongolian iguanodontian dinosaur has been discovered. Named Choriodon, this species was found to be very similar to the species Altihurus from the same location, and both were found to be very basal to the hadrosaurs, meaning they were not quite yet hadrosaurs like the more famous Edmontosaurus or Parasaurolophus, but they were very close to the ancestors for those species. And this helps us understand how the species were able to evolve and become more successful than their Iguanodontian counterparts, and able to 
adapt in such a wide array of different species and spread across the planet and the northern continents. The species also had a very large nose, much like Altahiris, and this can help us to understand how they and the later hadrosaurs would likely have used call as a main method of communication, as this is a common theme we get in very many of these species of having large noses or large nasal crests, such as the one seen in Parasaurolophus or other Lambiosaurs. A few years ago, scientists discovered Xenoposeidon, a large sauropod. However, a more recent study was able to place it even more directly into a proper group. Most notably, it is the oldest Robotosaurid, a group that is very similar to the Diplodocoids, however, did not directly lead to Diplodocus. This helps us understand why the Robotosaurids did not become nearly as widespread as things like Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, or Brontosaurus, all of which were closely related, but not in that same Robotosaurid group, which helps us understand how small variations in species can lead to very large impacts in the long run, particularly in how successful or not successful the species may become. And still on the Diplodocoids, the oldest Diplodocoid discovered was also announced. Coming from China, Lingwulong was a very small and very short-necked sauropod, which is very unique considering that things like Diplodocus and Apatosaurus are very well known for their extremely long neck and extremely long tails. Additionally, being from China, it reverses a lot of what we thought we knew about Diplodocoid evolution. Diplodocoids, such as Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, and Brontosaurus, are normally found in North America and parts of Western Europe. And so coming from China, this gives us an entirely new insight into where this species started and helps us to understand just how widespread and far detached from their origin point species can become, particularly as the titanosaurs are what came to dominate Asia during the later periods of the Mesozoic. And so this is very important for understanding how different species might be related across wide breadths of land, even if they aren't directly connected populations. All right, everyone, thanks for watching again. You can follow me on Twitter at raptor underscore chatter. So hope you guys all had a good summer. Hopefully you'll be getting back into school. Hopefully learn about dinosaurs during some of it. I know I'm excited to do some of that. So stay safe, take care, don't go extinct.